All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Carpenter, Executive Director for the Dakota County Historical Society, and uh, we want to thank you for attending our presentation tonight. It's part of our Discovering Minnesota Baseball series. Uh, tonight's presentation is Tony Stone, uh, presented by author Martha Ackman. Um, so as we go through, uh, to begin, I want to also uh, throw out a thank you um, to the Union Pacific Foundation. Um, this uh, event and all of our virtual programs are, are um, made possible by the Union Pacific Foundation. Um, we've been able to host about 30 different presentations since March on a whole variety of topics from genealogy to virtual concerts to uh, our Discovering Baseball series here. Um, so we want to thank the Union Pacific Foundation for their support. Um, in case you joined us after I made our announcement, uh, you are welcome if you want to turn on your camera. We do ask that everyone keeps their microphone turned off just to keep away from some of that feedback that might be coming through in the background. Um, if you do have questions, there is a chat box that you can use. Um, feel free to uh, throw your question out in there. And um, if Martha doesn't answer it throughout this uh, presentation here, I will go ahead and make sure we get it answered at the end. Uh, depending on time um, and how everything's going here, we may even open it up where if you want to, you can use your microphone and ask a question that way. Otherwise, if you're not comfortable, you're still welcome to use that chat box. Um, so as we go, if there are any issues with the presentation, and if you need something clarified right away, or if you all of a sudden can't hear us, um, throw it in that chat box. I will be monitoring that as we go. So you don't have to just use questions um, for it. Um, and those of you that don't know, uh, the Dakota County Historical Society is, um, our headquarters is located in South St. Paul. Um, we operate three historic sites. We were founded in 1939. Um, the South St. Paul Museum, our Washington Memorial Museum, is our um, headquarters for the organization. That is where we have our archive and research library. Um, anyone that's coming in to do research, that's most likely the place you would end up going to for it. Uh, we also operate the Leduc Historic Estate down in Hastings. Uh, that's an 1866 Gothic Revival Mansion. Uh, it has 15 different bedrooms and uh, 10 fireplaces, and it's uh, one of the, the gems of Dakota County. So we're, we're fortunate to have it. And our third site is the Sibley Historic Site, which is located in Mendota. And that contains three different houses, including uh, Minnesota's first governor, Henry Hastings Sibley, uh, Jean-Baptiste Faribault, and Hippolyte Dupuy. And uh, that site is where we try and talk about Minnesota's, Minnesota's early history in the fur trade. Um, as I mentioned, our programs are sponsored by the Union Pacific Foundation. So as COVID hit, um, as with many businesses and other organizations, we closed all of our sites starting in March. And we're fortunate to have two of our three sites open to the public um, that they opened in July. Uh, the Leduc Estate will be closing here um, for general tours. Uh, but we'll have a couple of drop-in tour opportunities. Our candlelit tours are coming up. Um, those are almost sold out and we're starting to book our holiday tours in November and December. So we, we expect those to sell out pretty quickly as well. Um, but as, as we all know, we are here today um, for a presentation by Martha Ackman. She is a journalist and author who writes about women who have changed America. Her essays and columns have appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and the Los Angeles Times. She is a frequent commentator on New England Public Radio and has been featured on CNN, National Public Radio, and the BBC. Uh, she is the author of the book Curveball, The Remarkable Story of Tony Stone, first woman to play professional baseball in the Negro Leagues. And if you can see our screen share, that is a cover of her book and I would highly recommend it. I was able to read through that a couple of year ago, years ago as I started doing some research on baseball myself, which is how I ended up um, getting connected with Martha. Um, she also is author of the Mercury 13, uh, the truth story of 13 women in their dream of space flight. And uh, today she's joining us from New England. So I will turn it over to Martha and feel free to, I, you said you had a new book that came out that I didn't mention. So feel free to throw it out there as well. <laughs> well, thank, thank, thank you so much, Matt. And um, uh, a pleasure to be with you all in, in St. Paul, a place where I spent an awfully lot of time researching this book. So I'll share a little bit of that with you. Um, uh, I'm in my home in uh, Western Massachusetts, and uh, uh, Matt 
asked me to mention my my um, my newest book. My newest book is about the poet Emily Dickinson. I uh, I live about uh, four miles from where Emily Dickinson was born and and wrote her poetry in Amherst, Massachusetts. And um, I'm one of those pandemic authors, so <laughs> the book came out on uh, February 28th, and I had a, a 22 city book tour scheduled for it, and I hit stop number one and, and COVID slammed everything down. So I'm getting used to, to doing Zoom. Um, uh, so uh, it, it's, um, it's a pleasure to, to be doing um, another presentation and on Tony Stone. So it's a, a book I haven't talked about uh, too much recently. So um, off, awfully good to be with you tonight. Um, let me tell you a little bit of what I had in mind of, of um, what I do uh, because people don't really know Tony Stone, although this may be a different audience, the St. St. Paul audience. Um, I thought I'd <clears throat> sketch out broadly a little bit about um, her life and her uh, baseball playing days and, um, and go a little bit more specifically in, into her time in St. Paul because there's so many great stories connected to her growing up um, in that area and, 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 um, and getting her start playing baseball uh, right, um, right in St. Paul. And then talk about her, her life in the Negro Leagues, which was the first time that she uh, was really um, on the professional circuit of, of playing baseball. A little bit maybe about my composition, um, how I went about uh, writing the book itself. I have a kind of system that I follow when I, when I um, write books about uh, American women, especially those that, that uh, people don't know much about. And then if there's time towards the end, um, uh, one of the highlights of my life was uh, uh, over the past nine years, I uh, worked with the great um, American play playwright, Lydia Diamond, um, and uh, a, a whole uh, wonderful creative crew to adapt Tony's story for the stage. And um, Tony Stone, that's the name of the play <clears throat> that Lydia wrote, opened in New York last summer and uh, um, want to talk a little bit about that and, um, and uh, maybe the prospect uh, once, once we get out of uh, this pandemic of the play going further around. So that's kind of what, what I had in mind. But let, let, me, let me begin with some kind of broad strokes about Tony Stone. Tony's dates are 1921 to 1996. <clears throat> the tagline there of, of my book is the uh, is her most significant accomplishment. She was the first woman to play professional baseball in the Negro League. Uh, she pl first played for the Indianapolis Clowns, that was the name of the, of the team, and then the legendary Kansas City Monarchs uh, in the, um, the early 1950s. Uh, she played with Willie Mays, she played with uh, Satchel, she played with Ernie Banks, she played with um, uh, uh, Jackie Robinson. Um, in fact, uh, uh, many baseball historians call her the female Jackie Robinson because she broke the gender barrier um, or the, the best baseball player you've never heard of. Um, another, another tagline is people find this just uh, really almost unbelievable and, and I did when I first heard about it is um, that she replaced Henry Aaron. Uh, Hank Aaron played um, infield uh, for the Indianapolis Clowns when he was coming up, when he was just a youngster, um, uh, barely, um, not even in, into his 20s. I think he was 19. <clears throat> and um, he uh, got the call to, uh, to move into the, um, into the major leagues. And uh, uh, so the Indianapolis Clowns, knowing that they lost their... Um, uh, you know, their, their real showstopper um, went looking for someone to replace him. And that was Tony Stone. So the woman who replaced Henry Aaron is another way uh, to think about Tony. Tony was born in West Virginia, but the family migrated to the Twin Cities area and she grew up in St. Paul. And that, that's really, St. St. Paul is really what, what she considered to be um, her hometown. She grew up in the Rondo neighborhood um, of St. Paul. Her house was in the shadow of Lexington Park. Um, she was known in the neighborhood as Tomboy Stone. Her given name is Marcenia Lyle Stone. 
but uh, because she was such an athlete uh, and excelled at just everything she attempted, um, she was known in the neighborhood as Tomboy Stone. They gave her that, that name. Her parents didn't think too much of it, I, I, I should say. Uh, but the, the first person who really gave her a break was a Catholic priest, a white uh, Catholic priest at St. Peter Claver Catholic Church. Um, and uh, Tony was having a hard time of it as, as a young woman. And in fact, she, um, as a teenager, and, and in fact, she was thinking about running away from home. Um, what, what tugged at her was her passion for sports and specifically baseball, even though she excelled at ice skating, um, uh, volleyball, basketball, football, even Red Rover. She was the most feared Red Rover player in, in her neighborhood. But baseball really won her heart. And she, uh, and she felt this tug between doing what felt so right to her and was so much a part of her identity and conflicts with her parents. The conflicts with her parents were not about playing baseball. They did not think that well, let me clarify that a little bit. They, they, it, it wasn't that they thought it was unladylike, a girl shouldn't be playing baseball, any of that. That wasn't caused, that, that, that didn't cause friction in the family. But rather, it was about, they didn't see any way for her to earn a living. And this was a family that felt very, very strongly about um, economic security, about their children having a future, about going to school. And they just thought, how in the world is a girl going to be able to have financial independence if, if this is what she's going to do. And you can hardly blame them. I mean, who, what, what role models were out there for what she wanted to do? Really, no one. Um, so there was some conflict. They, they ran Boinkin's uh, Barber and Beauty Shop in St. Paul that, uh, that catered to a, a white clientele, um, kind of graded on Tony, that Af African Americans African Americans had to come in through the back door to um, to get their hair cut. Uh, but they, they were quite successful, uh, really worked hard, um, established quite a, a work ethic uh, with with their children. Um, uh, Tony went to Hammond Junior High. I'm mentioning these names because I'm not sure if they're still around, but if they are, that they, they might ring a bell with you. Mechanics Art High School, where she did not have a good experience. She was called a special student. I never could, in my research, find out exactly what that meant, except that she didn't get very good grades. And Tony once said that um, <clears throat> when it came to high school, she went in and she went out. I think she skipped school a lot. And, but it wasn't because she wasn't engaged by learning. Um, she couldn't see anything around her that reflected her own experience. She said every history book she read, and she loved history, every history book she read, she said, we were cotton pickers, black Americans, we were cotton pickers and, uh, and everybody else was Cap Captain John Smith and Pocahontas. And she, she just couldn't see that very important uh, aspect of education, of seeing her own experience reflected back in her. She loved um, taking books out of the, the public library and did a, a, a large amount of reading on her own. But back to um, St. Uh, uh, Peter Claver and uh, her, um, her priest there, um, because she was having trouble uh, at, at home and threatening to run away, he had an idea and he said, um, uh, kind of pulled her aside and, and, and then spoke with her, her mother and said, you know, we have a boys baseball team here and they're not doing so well. And maybe if we put Tony on the team, that that might um, give her some focus and help, help in other ways. So that's indeed what happened. And the boys were not too happy about it. Uh, but then when she started hitting home runs and when she uh, showed herself uh, as, as a fine infielder, although she played, I think back in those days, every position that, that was offered her. She didn't like catching, but every other position. Once she showed what she could do, she won them over. And that, um, and, and that strategy was one she followed for the rest of her life. So she got her start doing there. She, um, she kicked around a lot at the Hallie Q. Brown 
community center, um, uh, made friends there with uh, uh, some, of the, some of the other girls who were interested in sports as she was. And then she started playing kind of weekend games with the Men's Meatpacking League in, uh, in St. Paul's and uh, in, in St. Paul and finally got, got her, uh, her start with kind of traveling, with traveling to play baseball with, this was the name of, of a barnstorming team called the Twin City Colored Giants. And they traveled throughout Minnesota and also into the Dakotas. Again, Tony was the only uh, young woman on a team of men. And these were um, by and large uh, older men, uh, maybe, uh, I mean, not, not in their 20s, but in, in their 30s and beyond. Tony loved playing with that team because not only did they treat her well, uh, she said it was her first professional job playing baseball. And by that, she meant she got paid a little bit. Sometimes it was only a ham sandwich and a glass of lemonade, but, uh, but she got paid. And she loved hearing their stories. Um, again, going back to her love of history and also their stories about strategy. Now remember, this is long before Title IX uh, when, when girls had e equal opportunities in, in, um, in school sports. And so she was never uh, taught the, the finer points of, of baseball strategy. Um, because uh, teachers just assumed girls didn't need to know that, and and uh, and so that that really was a boon for her to to get to uh, know more about um, kind of the in, in inside rules and the the inside strategy of playing baseball. Around this time, um, uh, the St. Paul Saints, the the minor league team, the white minor league team, was playing not too far from her house. And at, at this time, it was managed by Gabby Street, um, who was the uh, who went on to become the um, uh, the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals during the uh, the, the Gas House um, uh, uh, days, um, the Gas House Gang days. Um, it, it was said of Gabby Street that he was fluent in two languages, English and profanity. <laughs> and that tells you a little bit something about Gabby Street. And he, he, he was running this um, Saturday weekend camp for white boys who, who wanted to learn more about baseball. And Tony kept hanging around and hanging around and hanging around. And he'd tell her to, to scram, you know, to, 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 to leave, that this wasn't something for her. And then she came back again and came back. And he, you know, was impressed by her persistence. And he, um, uh, so she finally convinced him to give her a try. And he saw how good she was. And uh, he started talking with her and, um, and gave her uh, her first pair of cleats. Tony had a, a glove, a worn glove that she bought at the Goodwill uh, somewhere in St. Paul. And, um, so that that meant a lot. What what she didn't know, what Tony didn't know, is that at the time, um, uh, Gabby Street was a member of the KKK, and uh, that you know that was not altogether unusual uh, in baseball, and certainly in in uh, I think we're talking now about that 1936. Um, so. Uh, uh, in her early 20s, uh, Tony was still playing for the Twin City Color Giants, didn't really have a plan. Her dad set her down and said, Tony, you've got you've to make some plans here. You, you, you've got to begin to look to, her, look, look, look to the future. This is um, in the early 40s, and Tony's, uh, one of Tony's sisters had uh, gone out to the Bay Area. She was in the military. And so Tony said, why don't I try that? Why don't I go out to San Francisco? So she headed out to San Francisco. She um, connected with, with her sister and she started hanging around um, in the, in, at Jack's Tavern in, in the uh, sort of uh, in the, the Tenderloin district of, um, of, um, of San Francisco. And it was, it was there that, um, uh, Jack, Jack's Tavern was a, the, the social and community hub uh, for the black community at, at, at that time in, in, um, in the Bay Area. And uh, 
she started talking to people about um, her, her background playing baseball and she got some kind of a gig, uh, talked her way into it again with an American Legion team. And um, so somebody mentioned that she should contact the San Francisco Sea Lions, which was um, again, a, a, a regional um, a team, not barnstorming, just playing with whatever team they, they could muster up. But it was a regional team that played on, on the West Coast and she did pretty well. Um, she's playing second base and uh, played there for uh, a, a number of years and, um, and then uh, got a better offer from uh, another semi-pro team, the uh, New Orleans Creoles. And she went down to, to play in New Orleans for a, a couple of seasons. Um, we're, it, we're now looking at about uh, 1947. And, and that, that's when baseball changes. That, that's when Jackie Robinson um, integrates the major leagues and uh, becomes the, the first African-American to play in Major League Baseball um, with the Brooklyn Dodgers. And that moment presented um, uh, a curious set of circumstances for the Negro Leagues. Because the Negro Leagues, uh, a proud, proud uh, social and economic institution uh, in, in the Black community, celebrating, I should say, its 100th anniversary um, this year. Uh, the Negro Leagues in 1947, with the integration of baseball, Major League Baseball, lost their fan base. As more and more fans began looking at Jackie Robinson and Larry Doby and uh, the other players that slowly, not quickly, but slowly began integrating um, the major leagues. And Negro League owners were faced with some real uh, economic peril and, and, and saying, now, what are we gonna do if people are coming to the, to the ballpark anymore? So, so this curious uh, situation of uh, integration being a, a step forward and uh, the, the, the vice put on uh, Negro League um, baseball um, offered an opportunity for a young woman who'd been knocking around playing semi-pro ball, um, Tony Stone. So when, as I mentioned before, when Henry Aaron moved to the major leagues, uh, Sid Pollock, who was the owner of the Indianapolis Clowns, knew he needed another gate attraction. And he contacted Tony, who had been doing very well with the, the Sea Lions and the New Orleans Creoles, and offered her a contract. Um, and uh, this was in some ways not a hard thing and other ways a hard thing for Tony. She had no illusions. She knew she was being hired as a gate attraction, but she also knew it would, it, it, it would offer the best shot she ever got of playing um, high level baseball in the Negro Leagues. So she took it. So in 1953, she became uh, the second baseman for uh, the Indianapolis Clowns, sometimes not playing all nine innings, uh, would trade off with um, uh, an, another one of the Clowns players. And she did pretty well at one time in July uh, of, of 1953. She batted 364, amazing, fourth in the league behind Ernie Banks. It didn't last long. She, she was only up there for a, um, a, a period of time. She had a lifetime um, uh, about a 250 average, which would get you a pretty good salary uh, today in baseball. She was known as a very good infielder, um, quick on the, on the double play at second base, um, scrappy. Uh, she was a good runner. Um, and she had struggles. As, as you can well imagine. Uh, some of her teammates were none too thrilled about a girl uh, uh, playing on their team. 1953, 1954, you know, this is the time when um, black players are saying, I, I, I wanna get noticed and I wanna move to the major leagues. And for um, a lot of black pit players who were aging out, you know, they were saying, this may be my only shot at playing in the major leagues. So they did not take 
not, not all of them, some, but not all of them took very kindly. In fact, they would do things like uh, throw the ball to her um, at second in such a way that she would have to position herself to, to be in the, in the path for, you know, a spikes up slide and into second base. Um, fans often jeered at her. Uh, they would yell, why don't you go home and fix your husband some biscuits? Um, uh, Tony, I should say, um, uh, married a man she met at, at, at Jack's Tavern, a man 40 years her senior that lived to be 104. Um, some newspaper columnists even uh, gave her a hard time. A columnist for the Chicago Defender, Doc Young, said Tony Stone should be run out of baseball on a softly padded rail. And yet there were many uh, fans um, and and uh, a sports writer who treated her with respect. Um, uh, I, I came across newspaper articles uh, at the time where fans waited for her af after games, uh, older women who just wanted, they said, to to touch her, you know, to 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 see if she was real. Um, Ernie Banks. Uh, I had long conversations with Ernie Banks. Um, uh, uh, when I was researching the book, and he he always said she was just so talented. And um, he said he years later they saw each other at a Oakland A's game, and uh, he he said he kind of spied her in the stand. She was somewhat far away from him, but but he recognized her, and he said he wanted to try to get over there and and talk to her because all all those years later. You know, he recognized what an extra burden uh, she had as a woman in baseball playing, and, and he definitely earned her respect. Um, she did so well, some baseball historians say that she carried the Negro Leagues on her back during the 1953 season. She did so well um, that Sid Pollock, the owner of the Clowns, said, I want to bring on some other women. So he brought on another second baseman, a woman by the name of Connie Morgan, and a five foot two right-handed pitcher, uh, Mamie Peanut Johnson. Uh, Tony felt a little crowded uh, when, when that happened. And when the opportunity came for her to be traded uh, to uh, play with the, with the, as I mentioned, legendary Kansas City Monarchs, the team that, that Jack, Jackie Robinson played with, she took it. Um, I, 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 I should say, um, uh, uh, one, one, one more thing about the, the, the obstacles. It's a rather <laughs> um, now well-quoted uh, uh, section of my book. Um, uh, one of the biggest obstacles Tony had was um, where to stay when uh, the, the team was traveling, especially through the Jim Crow South. And, um, you know, very often the, the team would play double headers and be driving, you know, two hour distances on a, on a hot, cramped bus uh, between cities to play double headers and trying to sleep on the bus and you know not getting much food and and stopping at places that wouldn't serve them because of Jim Jim Crow laws and and so they would finally at the end of the night pull into a boarding house with that they knew would accept um, uh, African Americans and uh, the guys would get off the bus dead tired and and. Uh, 28 men and Tony and the proprietor would get one look at her and make an assumption and s assume that she was a prostitute uh, traveling with the team and uh, said, you know, you, you can't stay here. There's a brothel mile down the road if you want to stay there. And it, it broke Tony's heart and, and really was a slap in the face that her teammates didn't say, wait a minute. This this is our second baseman, and she's staying here with us. And uh, so, you know, one night Tony didn't have anything else, anywhere else to go, uh, and so she went um, to the brothel where they directed her. And there, she said she met good girls who took care of her. Maybe she um, saw something in them of the outsider status that uh, that she herself so often felt. And they gave her a clean place to stay and and uh, gave her something warm to eat. And uh, even uh, when she began to frequent uh, uh, these places a little bit more, um, uh, became friends with uh, a, a lot of the prostitutes and they would um, sew padding into the shirts of her uniform so she could take hard throws to the chest. 
they then she, she kind of set up this network of brothels throughout the South uh, where they would um, sometimes meet her, you know, with a car and began attending the games and read the sports pages. And, you know, she did what, what she had to do. Um, uh, now, you know, as I said, Tony um, uh, never denied that she was being used as a gate attraction, um, but, uh, you know, it got her in the door. Uh, Sid Pollock, the owner of the clown, said, uh, you know, he took a gamble on Tony because he thought she was a good ball player, not that she was just a freak show, not, not that, that she was a freak show. He said, you know, if she doesn't play well, uh, fans will come to see her once. And then they'll, you know, forget it. They, 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 they saw what they wanted to see. But she did play well. Um, uh, and uh, uh, following her second year with the, Indian, with the um, uh, Kansas City Monarch, she, you know, things were getting harder and harder with the Negro Leagues. The season was getting shorter. And when the, the, the next year came around, the 54-55 season, um, Tony, who had had a pretty hard go of it with, uh, with the Monarchs, and I should say pretty hard go of it because of her manager, Buck O'Neill. You know, Buck O'Neill is so revered in baseball and for a lot of very, very good reasons. But boy, he was not kind to Tony. And I, I think he, um, you know, he was one of those players who was at the end of his playing days and saw that if he didn't get the call to the majors, it wasn't going to happen. And, uh, uh, so he and Tony really locked horns. He wouldn't play her. Uh, as I said, he was kind of mean to her. And, and so she, uh, she decided um, that was it for her. And she returned to the Bay Area, to Oakland, uh, where she said not playing baseball hurt so damn bad, I almost had a heart attack. Uh, those, th those years um, following the end of her playing days were tough for her. Um, uh, she, you know, she found some kind of pickup work here and there. She was a very good carpenter. She put on steps of their Isabella Street um, uh, row house in, in, in Oakland. Oh, knocked around, played, played a little bit of, of baseball, never softball, hated, absolutely hated softball. And, um, you know, then after, um, after a lot of years, recognition finally came. Um, uh, she was um, uh, kind of rediscovered in the, in the 90s and was inducted into the Women's Sports Hall of Fame. She was brought back to St. Paul, uh, where she, she was given a, a, a parade uh, and uh, where the, a baseball field in Dunning Park um, was named in her honor. Any of you have connections? Any of you have connections to Dunning Park, would you get her name spelled right? They're the maybe some of you know outside that field they have a a, a, um, a sign that says to Marcenia Stone and gives her dates when she played and they spell her first name wrong. So ay ay ay, you know this woman had enough problems in life not to have them continue in in her uh, in 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 her um, posthumous life. Um, a little bit about where are we here with time? Let me see. Um, um, just say one one more thing, and then we'll open it up for questions or anything else that that you might have. Um, uh, the great uh, writer David Halberstam uh, once wrote: "Behind every great sports story is the story of a nation." And if you think about that, um, I think he's quite right. You know, Jackie Robinson, we've been talking about, Muhammad Ali, uh, Billie Jean King. Uh, so when I set out to write this book, um, I, I wanted it to do three things. I kind of think of it as when I compose the book of, of three circles. And the first circle has to be, is it a, is it a good story? Uh, is it compelling? Will it, um, will the story of her life and her life in baseball keep readers turning the page? What happened? What happened? Does she get a chance? What happens when she gets a chance? And I thought, yes, there really is. Even though it was hard to, to research it because um, the mainstream press, the white press didn't cover Negro League. 
um, the, the black press did. Chicago Defender was a, a great resource for me, but not all of the, not all the scores were kept and not all of the, um, af after games, uh, uh, team managers did not call in the scores to the Chicago Defender or the or Defender wasn't able to keep it down or sometimes the scorekeeper would be the pitcher, a relief pitcher, and he'd be called in the fifth inning and then that's the, the, the scorebook would lay in the dugout and no one would be, um, uh, would be keeping score. These are the problems with um, record keeping in, in, in the Negro Leagues. And uh, uh, I think why, why so many Negro Leaguers are not in the Hall of Fame, because the, the records simply were in, incomplete. Um, but nonetheless, it is a good baseball story. So it, it, it uh, meets the requirement of that first inner circle, if you were, if, 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 if you will. And then um, that second, that second circle for me is the David Halverson quote. What does Tony's story tell us about America? You know, if every great sports story is a story of a nation, what does this, this tell us about who we are and what our past has been? And I think undeniably that this is a, a, a a story about Jim Crow America and uh, using the lens of baseball to look at racial inequity, uh, to look at gender uh, um, inequity as well. It certainly provides us uh, with a very, very vivid and unique window in, in, into um, those days in the, in the pre-Rosa um, Parks, uh, uh, Martin Luther King civil rights era. Tony uh, stopped playing um, just about the time Emma Till was was murdered. So this is in the uh, kind of the early days of the of the awakening um, of the of the civil rights movement, and then that so we got good sports story. We got tells us something about Jim Crow America, and that last circle for me when I'm when I'm thinking of a book um, has to be what does this story tell us about um, the human condition about who we are as, as human beings. And that is often the toughest, uh, the toughest question to address. Um, and I thought and thought and thought as I was in my research stage and um, gathering information in St. Paul, trying to you know, interview childhood friends of Tony and um, I couldn't get it, I couldn't get it. And I, you know, I told myself, well, you know, keep going, maybe, maybe it'll come. Um, in, in researching this book, I spent an awfully lot of really enjoyable time um, interviewing former uh, Negro League players who played with Tony. I should say Tony died in 1996 before I began researching the book. Um, I didn't start um, on the book until about 2007. Um, so I, I gathered stories from um, a lot of men who, who played with her and uh, as I said, in, in, interviewing people like Ernie Banks. And, um, and one of the guys I interviewed was somebody who played with her on the, on the clowns. His name was Thomas Taterbuster Burt. Always such great nicknames these guys had. And I went down to Virginia and I, I, I interviewed Tom, spent a lot of time. And, and um, as I was getting ready to pack up to leave, uh, I, we were just making conversations and I was asking him how he kept his hand in, in baseball these days. And he said, oh, I, I uh, help my uh, grandkids in, in their uh, little league teams. And, and I said, what's, what's, the hardest, what's, what's the hardest thing for you to teach him? And he said, how to hit a curveball. Now I'm a pre-title nine girl. Uh, and I, I went to, um, I grew up in St. Louis, St. St. Louis Cardinal fan. And uh, I went to high school in those days when they didn't teach us anything in, in PE about strategy of baseball. I mean, it was, you know, run around the field, uh, player game, but nothing about strategy. They didn't, you know, they didn't take us seriously. And um, so I said to Tom, well, tell me, what's, what's the secret to hit a hitting a curveball and uh he said well get up and he, he had me get up and assume a stance and and uh he said the secret to hitting a curveball is to step into it not away from it kind of counterintuitive step into it not away from it i took down that note and uh months and months and months went by and i'm continuing to look for that larger circle of what what does this tell us about human beings and and then it finally came to me uh that um tony stone was given one imperfect chance to live her dream. She knew she was being used. One imperfect chance to live her dream. And what did she do? She stepped into it. 
So I think that that's the that's the kind of the larger lesson of the um, of the book, the risk that she was willing to take, uh, the passion with which she wanted to live her uh, most authentic life, and uh, and um, that that certainly made a great impression on me. So I think I will stop it there. I've gone way over, Mr. Carter. So um, happy to answer any questions or uh, we'll go back to other things. Yeah, no, thank you. That That's great. Um, to, I'll give you a, a quick break here. I'm going to jump into a different screen and uh, <clears throat> so hopefully you, you now switch screens. Um, so I actually started doing research on black barnstorming baseball teams when I was with the Dunn County Historical Society mm -hmm. in Menominee, Wisconsin, and uh, I, I stumbled across an article about a um, in the Dunn County News from 1938, and this is the article right here. It says the Giants defeated um, were defeated by Connorsville. And reading it, it talked about right here in the middle uh, in the eighth inning, the Giants yeah. put in Tomboy Stone, and uh, so this was the Twin City uh, Color Giants. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as you can see here in the box score, there is uh, a Tomboy Stone that played left yeah. field that went 0 for 1 in this game. Now, Connersville is basically, um, it's a farming community. So this game would have been played in the middle of a cornfield, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, the other thing I want to point out, right down here, this gentleman here, Pafko playing center field was Andy Pafko. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Andy Pafko, if you're not familiar, went on to play in the Major League Baseball. Um, he played with the Milwaukee Braves. I believe he was there when they won the World Series. And mm -hmm. also um, in the uh, Bobby Thompson's shot heard around the world, he's the left fielder that watches it sail over the fence. <laughs> um, so he, he's a, a, I think he played about 13 years or so in, in the professional uh, baseball, but they were both about 17 at the time playing in this, in this cornfield against each other. And I, I often try and wonder how many other professional players did she end up playing against yeah. Yeah. that, you know, maybe they're in a cornfield or whatever. And I, I know one of the, the questions or comments from Trish, um, she mentions in, in the chat that the River Falls Journal said that the colored giants played in Wisconsin. And so, yeah, they, he did an interview with a gentleman that was a pitcher that for Menominee in the 1930s and, he said that this woman came up to bat against him from the Twin Cities. And uh, he, she was on that, one of those barnstorming teams playing him. And uh, he went out to the pitcher and they were talking and they said, yeah, we'll, we'll take it easy on her. And then she hit it to the fence. And he said, that was the last time we did that. <laughs> yeah, he, the other comment he made was uh, they hit the ball to the outfield and she picked it up and threw a, a straight line ball to second base and threw the guy out. And they said no one tried to run on her after that either. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so those are those are just you know stories that I had heard about Tony Stone even before I was even made aware of Martha's book, and then we reached out. Gosh, this was probably oh, a long time ago. Yeah, now. yeah. Um, Boy, that is really something, Matt. I've never seen. I've never seen that clipping, and I've never seen her listed as tomboy in a in a lineup like 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 that. That's really, really? Cool. and it says she's she's playing left field. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she was still Excellent. playing all, all around in these in these days. Every, every, well, it's everything. hard to hard to imagine how many other articles are out there that probably. Oh um, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, I um, uh, I I was mainly reading um, Chicago Defender, uh, black black papers in in Philadelphia and New York, and um, uh, reading those uh in uh on, on microfilm and and I, I i couldn't get to all of them and i had a pretty tight deadline that i had to meet so i hired my nephews who were i think they were 15 and 13 at the time or maybe even younger they they lived in columbia missouri so the uh, big university of missouri uh library was there and they and they would and they would just re go through you know and just you know just look for her name and look look for box scores and then they'd send me xerox copies of it and i i had all of those <laughs> xerox copies on this dining room table where i am now and uh and you know try to put them together and i think i have the best uh uh collection of her stats from the from the clowns and from the monarchs but not from the you know the colored giants that's really great great stuff 
Yeah, so we had another question and I, I, I know that there were a couple people that joined in the middle of the presentation. Um, so actually the, the quite just asked another one. So the first question was, were there other women that played in the Negro Leagues? And then the second question is, have you met any of her family members? Yeah, the answer is, is yes to both of them. Tony uh, did so well with the um, with the Indianapolis Clowns that Sid Pollock took a chance on uh, two more women, and that was Connie Morgan, who was a uh, a young uh, second baseman out of uh, Philadelphia, uh, with the same kind of thing. Uh, you know, played always played with boys. Uh, thought uh, softball was too slow, and then a young woman out of D.C., um, Mamie Peanut Johnson, was was her nickname. Uh, she she tried wanted to try out for the so-called League of Their Own, the All-American Girls Baseball League. Uh, a lot of people ask that question. Why didn't they play with them? And the answer was uh, that they were segregated. Um, so uh, 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 Peanut, Peanut then was hired to um, play with, uh, with the clowns as well. Did I meet members of her family? Yes. Um, uh, a niece in particular was extremely helpful. Um, she lived, she and her mother, uh, Tony's sister, lived with Tony for a while in the Bay Area. So she had uh, a lot of contact there and she couldn't have been um, you know, more, uh, more helpful in, in providing information. And we were so delighted when Tony Stone, the play, which um, I'll talk about, maybe say a few words about um, later, um, we, um, as I said, we opened in, in New York last summer and then we had our West Coast opening uh, in March uh, of this year and uh, at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. And um, Tony's niece and other members of the family came to the play and um, I think they came to one of the previews not on opening night. and. Uh, loved it and sent thank you notes and uh, couldn't have been more pleased. I should also say, just another pan pandemic uh, sob story is um, we opened at, Amer at American Conservatory, as I said, our, our West Coast opening, got great reviews that, that night in the San Francisco press and then all theater was shut down the next night. So, so uh, you know, we, we were gonna be in, um, in Atlanta and DC and, and uh, several other places around the country. And so everything shut down and we don't know when, when we'll be back up, but, um, uh, but Tony's family did, did get to see it in, in San Francisco and I'm thrilled about that. Excellent. Yeah, I know one of the things that uh, after you mentioned to me that the, the play existed, we started looking around to see, you know, what grant opportunities could we maybe bring something like that to put, uh, and let people take a take a look and have an opportunity to see it. Uh, were you able to pull up that video? I yeah. did. Yeah. So what I'll do now is I'll do a screen share. And uh, the play is called Tony Stone by Lydia DeHyman. The director is Pam McKinnon, who uh, Tony Award winning director. Um, it was named the best new play by the Wall Street Journal. And uh, uh, it is just an, a knockout. And um, uh, Matt's got a, a, a little a little clip. Um, I think that shows a lot of its uh, choreography, which is was quite, quite remarkable. Yeah, so this is the Tony Stone montage. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll try and go full screen with it. Hopefully that helps see it a little easier. And uh, I'll hit play here. Or maybe not. I want to tell you something about reaching and me. Because you may have heard I am the first woman to ever play professional ball. weight of a thing and the reach, there's breath. And in that breath is life. 
So that, that makes me so happy to see <laughs> all those wonderful, wonderful actors. Um, uh, the woman who plays Tony is um, April Mathis, uh, who is just a, uh, an astonishing actor. And uh, she won the Obie Award, which uh, for best actor in an off-Broadway off play um, just a few weeks ago. So uh, wow. we are en enormously proud of it. Excellent. I know someone just uh, sent a message in saying that they, they're, they're excited to see if we can get it to come to, to Minnesota. So I Well, it should come to the Guthrie, should it? I mean, my goodness, uh, right, right, right there in the Twin Cities area is where, where it should be. Excellent. So with that, are there any other last minute questions anyone has for Martha? So while people may be thinking, I, I want to thank you again, an excellent presentation. And uh, uh, this will be recorded. So some of you might even be watching it on the, the recording rather than the live version. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll send this out and uh, get it uploaded to our YouTube channel. And anyone that has registered, whether they were able to make it or not, we'll get a, a link sent to them. And then we'll put it out through our social media and let people know that it's available for them to watch. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to send them to me. Um, you hopefully have my email and we'll make sure that if there are any questions, we try and get them answered. Um, otherwise, hopefully we'll, we'll find a way to try and get the play here one way or another and <laughs> we can go from there. If I, if I can just say uh, a, a, a couple of final things, Matt. One is just thank, thank you so much. I mean, I, I was so glad when, when you reached out to me again after our initial contact. Um, we can't remember how many years ago, but uh, I'm, I'm just very, very pleased to be able to, um, to be with your St. Paul listeners. And um, the other thing is I wanted to show my uh, Tony Stone bobblehead. You know you finally made it when you've got a bobblehead. So <laughs> this is from a company named Team Brown, and they just came out with these. And uh, it's uh, see her name there, and it's got the Indianapolis Clowns, and it's got her real number, number twenty nine, on it. So I just love that. And the other thing is, if if people want to follow. Um, more about uh, the play and uh, what's happening with it. There's going to be a reading of it with, with the New York cast. Um, you know, we can't get them on a stage, but, but we can do a reading of it. That, that's coming down the pike in, a, in, a, in the middle of November, I think. Um, if you want to know more about that or you want to follow some of my other books or even learn about Emily Dickinson, uh, you can catch me on Facebook on Martha Ackman Books. And it's, um, Ackman is not Ackerman, and it's got two N's on it. And uh, maybe Matt, you can, there you go. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's the best place to catch me as far as updates on Tony and the play and, and all, all the other books as well. So, so there was one, one last question. Um, it, it, it probably is a little more complicated, but how do you write about racism in a way that people don't feel preached to? Uh, well, I, I write in the style of narrative nonfiction, which means that um, I use the techniques of storytelling to tell a true story. So um, uh, setting, dialogue when I have it when, it, when it is real, I don't make anything up. But so I, I let, the, um, I, I let the, the actions themselves uh, speak. Um, I, I don't uh, enter as the, as the author and... Uh, and tell people what they ought to think. But um, I mean, a story about, about being uh, sent to a brothel says more about uh, uh, gender discrimination than, um, than, than I would preach about. Now, I don't need to preach about it. That, that is a pretty vivid story. And when I tell stories, uh, uh, when I tell details about Tony playing, for example, um, with the New Orleans Creoles and uh, 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 black patrons who came, black fans who came, had to sit behind chicken wire uh, uh, to watch the game, um, again, is one of those visit, vivid examples. So it's through examples, uh, it's through testimony of, of the players themselves. Um, I let, uh, I, I, I let um, those aspects of life and, and those stories speak for themselves. 
All right. Well, we have hit just about an hour. So what I'll do is I'll, we'll end it here. And, and again, thank you, Martha. It's an excellent presentation. I highly recommend uh, getting her book and reading through it, especially, you know, you've only been able to cover so much within this hour. So there, there's a lot more to, to learn about her. And um, again, feel free to keep an eye on, um, you know, Martha mentioned Martha Ackman books. Um, and again, we'll, we'll put out there through social media when the video is ready to, to be reviewed again as well as any update on what we can do to try and bring that play to, to Minnesota. So with that, thank you everyone. And uh, you can expect a um, email with that link and a survey um, just to kind of let us know how we're doing with our virtual presentations and if there's any future topics you wanna hear about. So with that, thank you everyone and uh, have a good night and we will see, hopefully see you again in the future. Thank you. Bye-bye, thanks, thanks Matt. Bye. Take care.